The unknown. It is possibly the greatest fear anyone can face, especially a commander in wartime. So much so that it has its own military expression, the fog of war. Because of the drone view experienced by players around the table, Fog of War is often not represented by traditional miniature war games, despite the major impact it had on the hearts and minds of historical wartime commanders. But remote gaming, which has become increasingly popular these past few years, creates realistic Fog of War without any additional rules, since player perception is largely shaped by their camera view. So. We at War Games Tonight decided to run an experiment in remote gaming that plays to its strengths by hosting a war game in which Fog of War would be a dominant feature. We decided on a fast play World War I naval miniatures campaign game with role play elements. The naval actions in the Mediterranean during the opening of the war, specifically the search for the German ships Goben and Breslau, seemed especially promising as a scenario. Our players were recruited locally and online, and ended up being scattered across seven states, as well as the Republic of Panama. To play the game, our referees sent individual players a narrative describing their situation via email or WhatsApp messaging. Players were then asked to send back their orders, along with video of themselves, throughout the campaign. Unit locations and moves were plotted on a map divided into grid squares about 32,000 yards across with the assistance of the Berthier Campaign Manager, a free piece of software that allows gamers to set up and run their own campaigns. Players were given sets of rules, but were kept unaware as to the identity of the other players. In this way, communication between the players had to pass through the referee who could recreate the limitations of radios of the time by having messages become garbled, jammed, or lost. In addition, messages between ships of the same navy were assumed to be in code, but those to allied navies had to be sent in the clear, allowing anyone intercepting to read the message. Historical weather data of Palermo, Sicily during August 2014, the 100th anniversary of the action, determined the distance at which ships could be spotted. A fair number of civilian ships were included in the game. Many were from neutral nations, and their purpose was to create false contacts. When opposing units encountered one another, the referees set up a game of C. Vis Packham Fast Play World War I Naval Wargame Rules using 1 to 6,000 scale figurehead ships. Ours came from their U.S. distributor, The Last Square. Along with the narratives, players received photos of the action taken from the perspective of someone standing on the bridge of their flagship. Two battle stations. The identity of the enemy ships was not told to the players, but they were each given a ship recognition guide so they might identify the enemy. The narratives also included clues describing the caliber of incoming shells and the speed of enemy ships. So our players had to set up patrols and glean information about both the enemy and their own allies from incoming reports, radio intercepts, and scanning the horizon for boiler smoke. When they first encountered the enemy, they would not know precisely what they faced, and they had to rely on their ability to interpret the bridge view photos, incoming signals, and battle description provided by the referee. It made for some tense gaming that put our players squarely in the role of a World War I naval commander. Our campaign scenario began on the 3rd of August, 1914, the eve of World War I. This was a time of great uncertainty. Austria-Hungary, France, Germany, and Great Britain were mobilizing but were not yet at war with each other, and no one was certain if Italy would support Austria and Germany or remain neutral. One thing that was known was that France desperately needed three divisions of tough North African infantry transported to the border with Germany. But there was one serious obstacle standing in the way, the Gobin. The Gobin would be hard to stop. She was faster than any French warship, had protection close to that of a dreadnought, and guns that could outrange almost every opponent. Winston Churchill, the British First Lord of the Admiralty in 1914, said the Gobin 
would easily be able to avoid the French battle squadrons and, brushing aside or outstripping their cruisers, break in upon the transports and sink one after another of these vessels, crammed with soldiers. Additionally, the Gobin would be difficult to locate, since the French had no reconnaissance aircraft and lacked scout cruisers. And while they had a large navy, they would have to be spread thin to escort all the troop transports and patrol for the Gobin. This deployment into penny packets would present the small but capable Austrian navy an opportunity to sortie and destroy a small isolated unit of slower French ships. Perhaps the Gobin and the Kriegsmarine could even inflict enough damage to draw Italy into the war on their side. High stakes. Great uncertainty. Just how will our intrepid players handle this? Hi, I'm Zach. I am playing the British Commander-in-Chief for this campaign. I'm going to have some very interesting decisions to make during this campaign, and very exciting to make them. Well, first I'm going to split my force into three squadrons of almost equal numbers. One to patrol the Ionic Sea to be sure that the Germans don't break out and threaten the French troop transports in North Africa. And two of my groups to um, patrol the streets of Sicily and form a blockade to be sure those dirty Germans don't get in. I think that's what I'm going to do. The Austrians began cautiously. Hello there. My name is Flotten Commandant Patrick von Wooded, and I should be commanding the Austrian fleet from Yorktown, Virginia. My initial orders are to move our mighty battleships from their current berth at Pola to the southern port of Pitaro and send out a squadron of light cruisers to patrol off the southern coast of Malta. I understand that the Empire is not yet at war, and my ships are under strict orders not to fire unless fired upon. The French planned on staying entirely in the western Mediterranean. Hi, I'm James and I go by Highflower on the Little Wars TV Patreon Discord. I've been naval gaming since 2014 and I'll be commanding the French in the campaign. My current orders are to protect the transports heading from Africa to Toulon. I plan on taking two different approaches. I want to have dedicated warships groups patrolling the choke points into the western Mediterranean. And I'm also going to have dedicated convoy escorts comprised of pre-dreadnoughts, armor cruisers, and destroyers in case any enemy combatants slip through the choke points. The campaign began during the early morning hours of the 3rd of August, with the referee sending each player their starting narrative. Our French commander had to issue his initial orders with no solid information about any navy other than his own. His first possible news about the British came at 1 a.m. when a mysterious uncoded radio message claiming to be from the British was received from the direction of Malta, requesting French assistance. Our respective fleets steamed quietly for the rest of the day. A few hours before sunset, news arrived that Germany had declared war on France. By dawn on the 4th of August, the Kriegsmarine were coaling safely in Kataro. As their light cruiser group discovered the British flagship Indomitable and her escorts about 120 kilometers south of Italy. Since they were not yet at war, the encounter ended harmlessly, but the slower and badly outclassed Austrian light cruisers prudently turned back, shadowed by the British. The Floten Commandant responded to this development by dispatching the SMS Radetzky and three other ships to join the light cruisers. He later added 18 destroyers. Meanwhile, south of Sardinia, the French commander made an important decision to respond to the mysterious invitation received at the outset of play by setting a course for Malta with his flagship, two pre-dreadnoughts, and their escorts. 
A few hours before sunset, the French commander made contact with the British forces patrolling the Strait of Sicily. He became alarmed when he learned that the British commander was off to the Strait of Otranto, where he might confront the entire Austrian Kriegsmarine with a single battlecruiser and a few escorts. So, he asked that they pass along a coded message, advising the British commander to turn back and meet him for a conference. The French commander's intervention was most timely, for unbeknownst to our players, at that very hour, both in our game as in history, the British were delivering an ultimatum. If Germany did not commit to honoring Belgium's neutrality by midnight, they would be at war with Britain. Our British commander accepted the French invitation. He turned his flagship towards the rendezvous, leaving behind a pair of light cruisers, the HMS Weymouth and the HMS Gloucester, and six destroyers as scouts. At midnight, Britain declared war on Germany. But then, contrary to actual history, news arrived that Austria-Hungary had declared war on Britain and France in support of Germany. In the Strait of Otranto, where the opposing naval forces had been drifting into and out of visibility. The stillness of the night was broken by the flash and thunder of gunfire. The initial salvos could not find their targets in the gloom, and immediately the British, knowing they were badly outgunned, broke off and disappeared into the darkness. Both sides were now free to report to their respective commanders. The floating commandant responded by ordering the Radetsky group to pursue up to Cephalonia, and should they lose the British, they were to proceed to Malta. So, the mighty Austrian Empire is at war with Great Britain and the French. Almost as soon as I received the news, I got a report that our brave sailors had repulsed an attack by the British. I've sent several small probing forces out into the Mediterranean to get a better understanding of the situation we are currently in. Uh, my fleets have encountered several small enemy fleets of cruisers and destroyers, but no strong resistance yet. At noon on the 5th, the French Admiral reached the rendezvous and found the faster British were already there. The British commander suggested that the flagships exchange codebooks, and the French commander concurred. From this point on, we allowed them to communicate without going through the referee. They then agreed on two different courses of action. The HMS Weymouth would try to bait the Radetsky group into a trap set much closer to Malta, where the combined British and French flagship squadrons would be waiting. Another trap would be set for the Gobin between Sardinia and Bizerta by the French division that had been guarding the Strait of Messina. A group of destroyers would broadcast fake radio traffic in the clear while pretending to be transports requesting British protection. Just before the conference, each of the Allied commanders received a report describing a distress call from a British freighter just north of the Strait of Sicily. But by this time, our admirals were deeply focused on the conference, and these reports were not responded to. Just what was behind these distress calls? They were the work of the Gobin. Unbeknownst to our British, French, and Austrian players, the Gobin had begun our game in the port of Messina. For, just as in history, Admiral Souchon, the German commander, had anticipated the outbreak of war and had put to sea two days earlier. There was just one navy who knew the Gobin's precise starting location, the Italians. My name is Alan Wright. All my wargaming friends call me AJ. It's a family nickname. Uh, and I'm going to be the, the nation of Italy. I'm going to take a, a, a Finnish approach and do what's best for Italy. So that's my plan. Although the Italian government was only hours from formally declaring neutrality, our Italian player opted to allow the Gobin to fill her coal bunkers. So as the, as the Italian commander, my goal was to keep Italy's sovereignty and to keep them from becoming, in my mind, a, a victim of, of the Gobin's threat. And I thought, there, the Gobin's in my port and it needs coal. I could send it on its way, but what are the odds that 
that puts me at conflict immediately. I didn't know, you know, how much coal the Goban needed and whether they were willing to take it by force. And so I thought the easiest way to, to, to remain neutral and out of the war was to send it on its way. And as Italy, make it somebody else's problem, right? I didn't have any, any, any real, any beef. And so my thought was give the Goban enough coal to get out of Italian waters. And that was, that was my rationale to make that decision. This gave our German player greater options. Hello, I am Ezekiel. I am going to play the Goban and the Breslau for the Germans. I'm going to coal up in Messina because the Italians are so kind to give me some resources. Then I'm going to head west and patrol throughout North Africa in the case of a war declaration. Slipping out of Messina just before dawn on the 3rd of August, the Goban headed west until at 9.30 p.m. on the 3rd, she was between Sardinia and North Africa. Here, our German player became intrigued by the radio traffic coming from the direction of Malta. So, he turned about and began to patrol between the northwest coast of Sicily and Baserta to get a fix on the source of these transmissions. This maneuver moved him just out of the path of the French flagship on its way to Malta. The patrol continued uneventfully on the 4th, but just past dawn on the 5th, Lookout spotted a plume of boiler smoke on the horizon to the west. Our German player cautiously intercepted, using the Breslau as a scout, and the contact was found to be a British freighter, who surrendered after getting off a distress call. Our German player chose to take the prisoners aboard and scuttle the freighter. Shortly thereafter, the Gobin captured and scuttled a second British freighter. With the sinking of the second British freighter, our German player decided that by now the Allies would be aware of his position and would be coming after him. So he set a course for just west of Sardinia. Unbeknownst to our German player, his course was just out of sight of the French convoy returning from Toulon towards Philipville. Just past dawn on the 6th, the French light cruiser Jurian was also heading for the west coast of Sardinia. Here she spotted a freighter bearing a Greek flag and decided to investigate. She got more than she bargained for. Hopelessly outclassed, the Jurian managed to get out a distress call, which was jammed. The French admiral responded to the last message of the Jurian by dispatching a division of three pre-dreadnoughts guarding the Strait of Bonifacio to investigate. Hi, I'm Alec. This is my first time doing a campaign with this system, uh, and we'll just see how it goes. I received orders to head southwest in pursuit of an, uh, an enemy vessel that I know essentially nothing about at the moment. Um, I left a few of my destroyers back to guard the strait and took the rest of my forces and followed orders and we now have gotten just close enough to start trying to identify what this foreign vessel is. So, um, you know, we have good armor and decent guns. Uh, and if it's just one enemy vessel, well, you know, come on, we'll, we'll take them on. Just past noon, the Gobin could make out this French division bearing down on them from the north. Due to overcast skies, the French ships could not be seen clearly. But the closer Breslau was able to identify the newcomers and signaled that they were French Danton-class pre-dreadnoughts. The French line could be seen turning west, which would bring their broadsides to bear. So our German player turned the Goban west-northwest and increased speed to place the Goban in front of the French battle line where she could be engaged only by the lead ship and at a range where the Gobin had a slight advantage. The gunfire of both sides was inaccurate, until finally at 12.30, the Gobin's 11-inch guns landed two accurate salvos, damaging Voltaire. For the next 24 minutes, the French destroyers laid down a smoke screen. There was a brief exchange of fire once the smoke cleared, but the Gobin had used up half her ammunition, and our German player decided to break off to the south. The French were too slow to pursue. 
By now, the French were fully aware of the Gobin's position, and the French admiral vectored in units from all directions, including a division that had been redeployed from the Strait of Messina to just south of Sardinia. Hey everybody, this is Evan, uh, Discord name Cheechman11 here. Um, I'm commanding the 2nd Division for the French, uh, and after deployment I had three dread or uh, pre-war dreadnoughts two cruisers and a host of destroyers and my initial mission was to set out and set up a decoy um, out into the ocean to try and draw out some of the germans and while doing that i actually had was relaying some messages that i was picking up out from open water here so i'm going to kind of see what happens and go from there just before sunset this french division detected the gobin there was a brief exchange which damaged a French cruiser. But our German player, now even lower on ammunition, turned into the setting sun and broke contact. So what had been going on east of Malta since the conference on the 5th? Well, the Radetzky group had pursued the British light cruisers towards Malta, but as the sun set, the Austrian commander became increasingly concerned about blundering into a trap. Hi, I'm Doug, and I'm the commander of the Radetzky Group for the Austrian Navy. My orders are to pursue a, a pair of British light cruisers and a couple of other British ships that were sighted south towards Malta. I have uh, a couple of pre-dreadnoughts, some cruisers, and destroyers in my group. And our orders were to follow these light cruisers that we can't catch down towards Malta, but my orders read for me to stop my pursuit at Cephalonia, which I was very glad to see because I was very nervous about what was out there in the ocean. Felt like the light cruisers were kind of leading me towards some sort of enemy formation, the British battle cruisers or the French Navy. That night, after another brief and bloodless skirmish with the British light cruisers, he turned back towards the Strait of Otranto losing the British light cruisers in the darkness. It's a trap. The French and British admirals, still anticipating the Austrians falling into their trap, remained unaware of the change of course, and it was not until the next morning, seven hours after losing contact, that the light cruiser HMS Weymouth found the Radetzky group heading away from Malta. Unwilling to let their quarry escape, our Allied commanders set course for the Strait of Otranto, by dawn on the 7th, they had caught the Radetzky group and decided to attack in two separate columns. The commander of the Radetzky group saw the telltale streak of boiler smoke to the south that heralded the approach of many enemy ships and prudently chose to retreat. While the Austrian ships could outrun the French column, at 0712, the British decided to stoke their boilers and accelerate to 25 knots and attack the Radetzky group alone. For 18 minutes, the Austrians retreated, taking fire without reply. The Austrian pre-dreadnought SMS Zrinyi was badly damaged and a British victory seemed at hand. Although many ships could be seen approaching rapidly from the north-northwest, the British chose to continue on full steam. But everything suddenly changed as the entire Kriegsmarine hove into view. Unbeknownst to our Allied commanders, the Floatin' Commandant had received news of the Gobin success and had ordered the concentration of his forces before making a sortie towards the western Mediterranean. The Indomitable turned hard to port, but was quickly damaged by a deluge of shells from seven different ships. In a desperate attack, the British destroyers drove through a screen of Austrian destroyers. They were then repulsed with heavy losses by the Austrian battle line without scoring any torpedo hits, but they forced the Austrian battle line to turn away, taking a little pressure off their comrades. It was not enough. The light cruiser Gloucester was destroyed under a hail of gunfire. The Indomitable took additional direct hits from 12-inch guns. Austrian destroyers were then able to close to just 500 yards and finish the British battlecruiser with two torpedo hits. The surviving British ships managed to retreat to the south-southwest as the Austrians regrouped and headed south at 15 knots. At this point, things were going well for the Austrians. 
I'm reporting to you from the bridge of my flagship, Veribus Unitas, after an engagement with the pompous British. The engagement started out uh, decently from my fleet. There was no major damage done to either fleet in the beginning. Uh, I continued on my course south, thinking that I had escaped a real fight, when uh, suddenly I found the enemy to my rear. The Austrians had missed signs of the French fleet passing by to the west. At this point, the French squadron was approaching from the west, but they were still too far away from the action to clearly make out what was happening, and their calls to the British had gone unanswered. The French commander could just make out a long, blurry battle line heading south, presumably of Austrians, and became concerned that the British were fighting this force alone. So he turned east and sped up to 20 knots to engage. The sudden appearance of a new, unidentified enemy force flustered the floating commandant. It was here that I admit I became a, uh, a little bit flustered in the moment, and I uh, turned my fleet in the wrong direction, away from the enemy. Ah! I quickly corrected this mistake and came onto a parallel course with the enemy, and opened fire. This was to be the real fight. By the time the French had closed to 10,000 yards range, their commander realized there were no British ships to rescue, and worse, his path south toward safety was blocked by Austrian cruisers and destroyers. He chose to turn south, bringing the battle lines on a roughly parallel course just inside effective gun range and on a collision course with the Austrian destroyers and cruisers. Both sides ordered their destroyers to attack without regard for losses, and the combatants traded heavy blows over the next six minutes. The Austrian cruiser St. George sank quickly, and the Austrian destroyers suffered terribly. There was moderate damage done to our fleet, as uh, that happens. The Austrians scored a torpedo hit on the French flagship, the dreadnought Corbet, and repulsed the French destroyers with heavy losses. All but one French ship was now damaged, one of them severely, but none of them sank. Finally, the Corbet took aim at the old, obsolete Herzog Ferdinand Max at 10,000 yards range, and every 12-inch shell scored a direct hit. She sank instantly. At this critical moment, ships that neither side could identify were spotted approaching from the southwest. At this point, our commanders had to decide their next move. Although his gunnery had been superb, our French commander knew the odds were still stacked against him. Um, I guess to give a little background to what I'm thinking here is originally the intent of actually engaging uh, the Austrians, because I could see there's a very large force, but what I was confused, I, I could, I figured out that the line, the, the great line of Austrians was towards their battle line, but what I couldn't figure out was whether or not some other ships in the distance and in, in the blurriness of the picture, whether or not that was the British, because we had lost communication with the British, and I wasn't sure if they were still there trying to get out, and they were in this, like, running gun battle of some sorts, um, so I decided that uh, either I could get closer, risk engagement, try and help out the British if they're there, <laughs> um, or just run away and leave the British behind if they are there. So, it, you know, I had to take a moment to really think about whether or not it was worth pursuing. Um, and I went with the, let's presume the British are there and need some help. Um, seeing that battle line, even if the uh, the battle crews are still alive, they would definitely need help. Um, and I, I after approaching eventually coming to realization that the British were not there, uh, my instinct was, let's get out of here then. It's no longer worth pursuing this battle. Uh, but the problem was that all the uh, Austrian uh, cruisers and destroyers were in the direction that I needed to turn to get back to Malta. And I would have basically had to cross right in front of them and risk torpedoes attacks and all that sort. So I made the decision that the goal of the battle at that point was to just fight my way to the exit. Meanwhile, the floating commandant had only the bridge view photos sent to him by the referee to determine just how much of the combined Allied navies he was facing. He suffered the loss of the cruiser St. George and uh, 
the pre-dreadnought battleship Erzog Ferdinand Max, which, eh, and, uh, we also lost several destroyers. But these losses were not in vain, however. Before being claimed by the sea, our brave destroyers were able to torpedo one of the enemy battle cruisers. I have reports that the enemy battle cruiser has been heavily damaged, and they lost one of their cruisers, and several of their destroyers as well. At uh, this point, the battle was beginning to turn against my favor, so uh, I ordered the remaining destroyers to lay a smoke screen to cover our withdrawal to Kataro. Uh, this battle, now known as the Battle of Otranto, went about as uh, well as it could. Uh. So both sides decided to lay down smoke and retreat. The Austrians managed to sink a French cruiser, but otherwise the fighting was over. The unidentified ships turned out to be the HMS Warrior and the HMS Duke of Edinburgh, which had returned to the fight rather than abandon their allies. The pair of cruisers didn't add much firepower to the Allied fleet, but they possibly added just enough uncertainty to save the French from annihilation. So ended the Battle of Otranto. We only awarded victory points for the loss of major combatants, so the Austrians could claim a slight victory due to sinking a modern British battlecruiser, which was worth two points, while losing only one pre-dreadnought, worth one point. The French could also claim a small victory by keeping the Kriegsmarine in the Adriatic, far away from their transports. Would it be enough to bring the Italians into the war on the side of the Central Powers? This is our role. If it's Snake Eyes, the Italians join the Central Powers. If it's not, well, if they don't, they join the end up joining the Allies. Here we go. Oh, 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 very close, close, very they close. They thought about that carefully. <laughs> <laughs> they thought about it. Let's return now to the Western Mediterranean. When we left her, the Gobin was using her speed and the cover of night to elude her pursuers. Low on ammunition and concerned about his coal supply, the German commander arranged for a rendezvous with colliers between Sicily and Sardinia. When he arrived at the meeting location, he got word of the Battle of Otranto and received new orders. Unknown to our German player, the Gobin's path to Istanbul was still blocked by most of the Royal Navy. A final battle seemed imminent but our British commander sank with the HMS Indomitable, and so appointing a new British commander was required. I'm AJ. I hear that the British are in need of a new commander. I'm going to take over command of the Inflexible, and I'm going to be senior British commander of the Mediterranean, uh, help, help the campaign out with a needed uh, role. So the news I have is that the Indomitable has been sunk, and the remnants of the British uh, French Allied fleet are heading to Malta. And the Gobin is in the area, and I didn't. I don't feel like the Inflexible is a good enough speed bump, and so my plan is to head into Malta, wait for the entire fleet, coal up, and then head out as a wolf pack, uh, and attempt to to uh, detain the Gobin, sink the Gobin, or chase it, whatever's necessary. But I, I don't think, based on the sinking of the Indomitable, uh, running the inflexible out in front of the Gobin makes any sense. So that's, that's my decision is I'm going to wait in Malta for the rest of the fleet and go out strength in numbers. So the Gobin and Breslau were able to pass quietly by Malta during the early morning hours of the 8th of August while the Royal Navy was in port and they reached the entrance of the Dardanelles early on the 10th. This was a critical moment as German diplomats needed just a bit more influence to convince the Ottoman Empire to join the war on their side. In our game, as in history, the Ottoman authorities initially refused to grant the German ships safe harbor, but eventually agreed to purchase the Gobin and Breslau while retaining their German crews. The new Ottoman warships, renamed the Yavuz and the Medili, steamed past Sedi Bar Fortress that afternoon. Three months later, they would fire the shots that brought Turkey into the war. We'd like to thank our players. Everyone played a great game, 
and it took a sincere love of historical gaming and a bit of courage to plunge into the unknown with us on this experimental project. We learned that remote play can be exciting and thought-provoking. We also learned that in games that focus on fog of war, what goes on in the hearts and minds of the commanders is powerful. Plus, it's a lot of fun. So, we'll be experimenting with new ways to introduce Fog of War into our games. If you have a Fog of War mechanic that you think works well, send it to us at wargamestonight at gmail.com and maybe we'll give it a try. Thanks for watching, and please stay tuned for just a couple more minutes. Our players sent us a lot of fun footage that we couldn't work into the regular video, but we're going to include some of it here. And please remember to like and subscribe. We appreciate your support. Is it possible that I can take all the deck guns off my destroyers and some of my light cruisers and put them in the I ordered the entire Austrian fleet, my flagship at the lead, to sail for France to show these perfidious English and Frenchmen that the Goblin is not alone in the Mediterranean. True to our word, we'll have a destroyer group, a light cruiser, and a... Um, there's, no, there's no need to be true to our word as a group. I know, but the thing is... It's a trap. <laughs> um, can I repossess ships for the Admiralty? Uh, can I? Wait, I'm going to say no again. Gonna... You know, we have good armor and decent guns. Uh, and if it's just one enemy vessel, well, you know, come on. We'll, we'll take them on. Sided. Sacre Blue. Two battle stations. Um, question. One of my yeah. one of my freighters got captured and sent me a radio signal. What happened to that? What? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I expected. Yeah. Giving them coal and sending them on our way. No thank you for any war in Germany, please. Can I make a fire ship to send at the Germans? No. <laughs> in the role of a World War I naval commander. And we're done. Because I reworded some of that so it would read better, and then you used an earlier version. Oh no! Yeah. Okay. So let me just mark that up. Okay. No, you can't say anything, Kurt, and I haven't had a chance to talk to anyone on Discord. I know Rat's playing Patrick, and I, I suspect if he got his choice, it'd be the Austrian. The Austrian prince. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not asking you, I'm just saying, I, I know you can't say anything, but I suspect. I expect at this point that Rat is the one that is the Austrians if he got what he wanted. Um, thanks everybody, and I really hope you guys enjoyed yourselves. I did my very best on this one. It was very experimental, but I, it seemed like it came out okay. So when's when's the next game? <laughs> no, seriously. I would actually but, love to join your next campaign if you me if too. You, whenever you come to around to the next one. Thank you guys. That really means a lot to me that you guys had fun.